What is diversity? What is diversity? What is diversity? What is diversity? What is spirituality? What is spirituality? What is spirituality? How do they diver? How do they diver? How do they diver? How do they convert? How do they convert? How do they convert? How are we different? How are we different? How are we different? How are we the same? How are we the same? How are we the same? What is diversity? What is diversity? What is diversity? What is spirituality? Hi there. This is Angelo John Lewis for the Diversity and Spirituality Network podcast. In case you're not familiar with us, the Diversity and Spirituality Network is an emerging community of people actively exploring the integration of diversity and spirituality. Now, we all have different opinions as to what that looks like, but for me personally, I see diversity as nothing less than a sacred path in and of itself. I'd like to invite you to rate the podcast on iTunes which goes a long way to helping us spread the word and to share our message of sacred inclusion. Today, I'm honored to speak with Erica Huggins, human rights activist, poet, educator, former Black Panther Party leader, and former political prisoner. For the past 37 years, Erica has lectured throughout the United States and internationally and has done substantial work on issues relating to the physical and emotional well-being of women, children, and youth, whole being education over incarceration, and the role of spiritual practice in sustaining activism and promoting social change. And on a personal note, I'm not sure if Erica knows this, but when she was unjustly imprisoned in New Haven during the 1970s, I was one of perhaps hundreds of people who marched in front of the Justice Department demanding her release. I guess life comes full circle, and here we are speaking today, Erica. Welcome to the podcast, and it's my honor to be speaking with you. Thank you very much, and thank you for marching in New Haven when you did, and for, you know, showing up in that way. Thank you oh, very absolutely. much. And I'm, I love being here today. That's great, and I'm happy to be here with you. As I said in my introduction, Erica, speaking with you after all these years feels a bit like coming full circle. I see that since the time you were released from prison more than 30 years ago, you've established yourself as a bit of an exemplar of the integration of social activism and spiritual practice. I'd like to start out today by asking you to share a little bit about your spiritual and religious upbringing. Well, for me, religion and spirituality are two different things. One is set by something outside of us, religion. And it's great, and there are many beautiful religions. But the point of spirituality for me is that it's something set from within and is one's own um, fast or slow lane to the deepest and the truest part of oneself, myself, yourself. And so I was raised, having said that, I was raised in the Baptist church as a child and in my early teenage. And I decided that I wanted something more. I wanted to know how God existed within me. And I knew that the Bible said the kingdom of God lies within. But I had no one that I could um, speak to who could tell me about that. Where is within and what is God within and what does she look like? And so I was on a constant journey asking myself questions as a young teenager. Who am I and what is my purpose in life? And a set of events led me to begin to find out. Well, hopefully we'll get into that. Now, I know a lot of people who know of you know about your life as a Black Panther. So can you share share with me what drew you into a life of political activism in the first place? Well, it's really hard for me to talk of my life as political activism. Uh, I think that we have terms today which define people and place them in comfortable and uh, neat little packages. 
so that our minds can be can rest at ease. I just really loved people, and I couldn't understand from childhood why some people I grew up in washington d c why some people had everything and some people had little or nothing. It was very, very, very overt in Washington, D.C. to drive from southeast Washington where there were, I really never saw a white person unless I went into Maryland. And when I went into Maryland nearest my home, um, the white people were not the wealthy people I saw on TV. They were poor. And those children often didn't have shoes and had rotten teeth from malnutrition, like the like the children I grew up with, very poor, um, and also of color. So when I went to Northwest, the people were well dressed. They had in the winter time in D.C. It can be bitterly cold, and they had you know nice warm coats and beautiful boots and seemed so happy. And then I would drive away from D.C. with my my father driving back to southeast, and I'd see people literally shivering in the cold and children who couldn't come to school because they didn't have coats. I don't call that political. I was eight or nine years old when I first witnessed that. It's just my heart went out to humanity. I didn't like to see suffering. And I didn't understand why it exists. And it was my mother who explained to me in a very basic way um, the hist- part of the history of the United States, which is, you know has the horrible um, chapters in it of building an economy based on owning humans. And that the way the little white children across the Maryland line from D.C., treated me, the the names they called and the way they spit at me was because they'd been told, well, we may be poor, but at least we're not niggers. So I began to understand then not only race, but class, but I didn't have terms for it. And I didn't do anything with it. It just made me sad. And I asked my mother a million questions about uh, why it was so. And she explained that it had always been that way. Now I know what she was trying to tell me, that the illness of racism and the trauma of um, being poor um, are, are rooted in a systemic illness. It isn't an illness just... Um, that just the people of Southeast Washington or, or the little towns in Maryland suffer. It is global. And if we can't think global, well, at least we should know that in every town in the United States, all parts of the United States, um, that poverty um, creates um, suffering. And racism is a a term which means that one's own understanding of a better a better group of people, a better culture, a better way of languaging, a better way of looking, um, that all these things um, cause great suffering. And in many instances, um, death, death of the spirit, and often, I'm sorry to say, death of the body. Yeah, and sometimes, um, you know, I wonder to what degree we've actually grown, um, you know, as a, Americans. In, in other words, how much has things, things have really changed? But, um, you know, that's, that's a long conversation. But I know one part of it that you were intimately involved with was was the Black Panther Party. I joined the Black Panther Party because when I read about it when I was in college in my junior year, 
um, when I read about the Black Panther Party, what I read was um, all power to all oppressed peoples. And I love that. It wasn't just about African American or Black people or um, descendants of Africa. It was about all poor people. And that was what troubled me. I was just as troubled by the the white children with no shoes uh, who were malnourished as I was about the children I grew, grew up around. And the children I came to later, as I became a teenager, the children I tutored. And when I went to college, the children that I worked with in the nearby rural countryside of Pennsylvania. Um, so when I read about the Black Panther Party, I, um, I had wanted to be a teacher and I dropped that because I wanted to serve the world. I'd made a promise to myself when I was 15, when I attended the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom to serve, I would serve people for the rest of my life. And I had no idea what that would look like. So the term all power to all the people reminds me um, that the power is not only within, but it's held in places in, in society and that people should have access to that power, um, the economic, the social and political power of whatever system is in place. And people do not. Now, Erica, when I look at the mainstream media, there's a lot of, um, I, I, I guess, misinformation about the Black Panther Party and its history. And I wonder if you could address that a little bit. Um, I guess maybe a simple way to, to ask you is that if you were to characterize the contribution that the Black Panther Party has made to Black people's lives, to the body politic, what do you think the major major contributions and what do you think its relevance is today? First of all, I suggest that people do their homework. That people, people, all people, rather than assuming that what um, dominant media says is true, to investigate, to research. And upon doing so, you'd find out by reading the Black Panther Party's 10-point program that was written in 1966 and then revised in the 70s, um, you'd find that it was about providing health care for people, housing for people, the end to police brutality, minimizing over-incarceration by um, allowing for people to have a jury of their peers. And we know that a jury comes from the voter registration rolls. And I grew up in a time where people were just beginning to be allowed to vote, even though by law they had been given that right. So the Black Panther Party was about the human, not just the civil rights that we should be allowed, but the human rights that all, all persons should be uh, granted by just the very sake of their birth. So um, we created programs since the government did not at that time, the very first of which was the Free Breakfast for Children program, which so annoyed and embarrassed the federal government that they soon after the breakfast program became popular all over the United States and was replicated in other parts of the globe the federal government created the National Free Breakfast and Lunch Program as a result. Our very first community project, let's call it, was community patrol of the police, which people are doing now. The only thing is that at that time, it was fine to bear arms um, in protection of oneself. And there was certainly a lot to protect from. But there are people who believe that because, and I believe this is because of the, the 
lack of intervention to heal all of us as the result of American chattel slavery. I believe that the fear of Black people saying that they have the right to defend themselves with guns at that time was because of the fear of retaliation. And that reared its head again when Obama became president. There were people who said that Barack Obama was going to retaliate and kill white people. Where would that come from if there wasn't a sickness like a virus um, creating low-grade fever? It's always there, just always underlying everything is this fear. And we know that these biases, all of them, we could name every ism, every single one of them is based in fear. So what we were doing is uplifting African-American people. And we became a vanguard for movements like the Brown Berets, who were um, Chicano, Mexican, uh, the Young Lawyers Party, Puerto Rican the American Indian movement, the women of color movements, even the white, the earlier white women's movement. And if you want to ask me what I mean by that, I can certainly tell you. Um, all of these took our, our organizing principles that you go to the people and you ask them what they need. If we went to people today and in poor communities and said, what do you need? They would say what they said to us then. All right, my brother, my husband, my grandfather, my father, my mother, my aunt are locked away in a prison that's three hours away. I need a way to get there. That's exactly what we listen to. And as a result of listening to that, we created the free busing to prisons program. When people said that they needed free health care, the government wasn't doing that. We created the people's free medical clinics. There are books written about all of this. If at some point you want me to name some books, I can. Young scholars of color are now writing in the last two decades, are now writing about what we really did. But you know, they say it takes 50 years before a person or an organization that has been infamous becomes famous. Mm. Now, I know at one point in your life, you were unjustly in prison and spent time in solitary confinement. Yes. Can you speak a little bit about what you learned about yourself during that time? And just how you survived? Well, I learned everything about myself. When you are alone in a room and there is no, no exit key, um, you, you learn to, um, face yourself. I didn't have any way in or out of that cell. So I had to face my own self. And what I recognize that I recognize two things. The, the horrible suffering of the impact of multi-generational trauma from slavery had impacted my own family. And I needed to look at what that had caused in me. Did I feel worthy of being on the planet? Sometimes no. Did I feel good about myself? Sometimes no. Was I um, aware that I am as intelligent as the next person? Sometimes no. So I looked at all of these things and I wrote a lot and I write poetry. So I wrote poetry about it. Also though, the reason for which I was incarcerated um, was not pleasant at all. And this was three months after um, my baby daughter was born and three and a half months after uh, her father, my husband, had been murdered by an FBI orchestrated plan. So I was very sad. 
And so all of these things, or because of all of these things, especially not being able to see my daughter um, more than one hour each week, I um, taught myself to meditate. I asked for a book, and I found that sitting quietly and noticing my breathing eased the sadness I was feeling and gave me clarity about all of this inner work that I had embarked on, um, not but not because I knew I needed it, but because it was right there for me to do. Mm. Erica, what happened in your life that made spiritual practice an integra- integral part of the way you do social justice work? We are all of spirit. We're humans. We're not just bodies. We're not just minds. We we are um, heart. And how I like to think of it is that there is this one gigantic heart, and we're all connected to it. Um, a child gave me this image once, and it works. And she said that since we're all connected to this big heart, which is at the core of the world, she said, um, it's like there are little strings connecting us to the big heart. And if someone tugs one string, we can all feel it if we pay attention. So I I feel like if a little child could tell me that and I could understand mm. it in my own self, then there's truth in it. And um, we're, we are spirit. And um, that is what, for me, um, religions originally tried to say. And then the interpretations and interpretations can sometimes get in the way. So um, God exists within me as me, um, for me, and therefore for everyone else that I connect with. And the same is true for you. God exists within Angelo for him, um, and it is him, and it will impact all the other people, for instance, who listen to his podcast. Um, So... And and by God, I simply mean that which is greater, that which is good. I think that's the origin of the word God, mm-hmm. the old, old Anglo-Saxon word good. So I think we've lost touch with spirit. And whenever I um, speak with people who are from Africa originally, who I've met in the United States or have met there, People from Asia who I've met in the United States, um, they whether they're South Asian, Central Asian, Southeast Asian, it doesn't matter. Um, this this idea of the connectedness of spirit that may, it, that that which is human um, is always there. It's always there, and I think in our Western competitive. Um, uh, world, we've lost touch with our connection. We've lost touch with our hearts. We've lost touch with those threads that little girl told me about. Um, we don't. We don't feel the tug. Um, and when she said that to me, it reminded me um, that all of the great ones. All of the great ones who've ever walked on this planet have always wanted the end to human suffering. Mm. And each one of them said that the way out is in. in. They didn't say, instead (laughs) of taking what you know, once you have some understanding of that which is in, they didn't say, and don't go do anything with it. And that's what I do. My, I take my understanding with me 
as I navigate the world. I don't hide out. There are days when I would love to because there's so much suffering. Um, but I don't hide out. I go out there and as much as people, especially young people, would like to talk about it, I'm there. I'm only one person, but I know there are other people who are doing the same thing. I think that that's the model that the great ones gave us. Um, yes, meditate and feed children. Those two things can go together. Um, but you know, sometimes we get very self-referenced and very all about our own spiritual path and not about others. And I can't do that because I was that little girl who asked all those questions about why do people suffer? Well, here's the issue that I have, and maybe you can help me with this. And it's, it's an apparent duality. And, um, I'm sure this is something that you've thought about. So let's, if, if I'm going to speak dualistically, let's say we have like a, a structure and individuals that represent power and these powerful people, um, essentially form a group that oppress the group that I'm with. So, uh, so on one hand, um, I can consider myself spiritual, but on the other hand, I have to deal and I have to deal, uh, progressively with these systems of oppression. And sometimes, to be honest, I have difficulty reconciling these two things. You know, one part of me wants to basically fight. And another part of me um, is thinking, well, fighting is not the not not the right way to go about it. So, um, does my question make any sense to you? And if so, um, what is your what is your sense about that? Well, you you were right when you said you're speaking in a dualistic yes. way. That's part of my answer. <laughs> okay. Um, if you are. Um, about your own spiritual work, and you certainly, because you belong to a network, are connected with people who are, then you you must fight. But you're not fighting human beings. You're fighting the, the dark places uh -huh. that keep us trapped and bound. You are a warrior in that way. Um, I was once told by... Um, a most beloved teacher, if there is a just cause, fight for it. And I, right immediately when that was told to me, I thought of Mahatma Gandhi. He fought. But not in the way that we define that term. He, he battled darkness. And that's what we have to do right now. We have to call it what it is and battle it, um, understanding what it is. So it's not just a, um, uh, it's not a political power dynamic. You, if, if those that are in power form a group and disempower others, then we can form our groups, empower ourselves and others. It's not we're not letting, we don't need to let, let me put it that way, others dictate how power moves because every human being is powerful within. There is a source of power within every human being that is infinite. And if we tap into that source, we never feel disempowered. We can be told we are. We could even emotionally feel like it sometimes. But if we know that that infinite source is there, we will tap into it for clarity. Um, and for, in some instances, a practical next step. I think that we're taught that the mind and the heart are two different things. That the spiritual and the political are two different things. We have all these old, uh, tired definitions of how things work. But in, in, when I was incarcerated and I got a glimpse of the power within me, 
it wasn't uh it was it's not aggressive mm. it's not it's not it doesn't move in binary ways it's 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 strong it's actually tough and it's very gentle and sensitive um we have everything within us to make change in ourselves and to impact change in the world. It may not happen in my lifetime. It may not happen in your lifetime. It may not happen in my children's lifetime, but it will happen. I think we become very impatient with what we see outside us, thinking <laughs> that what we see outside us is all there is. That's that's so that's extraordinarily that well said. And I want to just move a little bit. I know that you've been involved with restorative justice work. Um, could you maybe explain to me what basically what that is and what is its importance as an instrument in social change? Well, what we have currently, the system of uh, arrest, adjudication, incarceration, and then parole and probation. Those are all punitive. A punishment really doesn't change people. It really doesn't. For the rebellious, it makes them do the same thing over and over again. And for the frightened, it pushes them into submission. But punitive practices don't change the human heart. I know that from personal experience. There was nothing in that prison, nor is there very much in the prisons today, that, quote, rehabilitates. There are beautiful programs that have come into the prisons and jails um, from the outside and from some really wonderful um, court officials and others who have compassion for human beings. And there are places in our world where the notion of prisons as we know them here in the United States have been abolished. Um, restorative justice does exactly what those two words say. It restores justice. It, it, it comes with, it comes up with a way that a person who has caused harm is accountable and responsible for that harm. And if possible, is able to speak to the person they've harmed or at least send their best wishes if they cannot speak to that person, to the person they've harmed. And they are also able to tell that harm out loud to others. That is the beginning of healing. That's in a, that's in a, that's in a carceral site. But let's say restorative practices in a school setting prevent, um, or clog the, the cradle to prison pipeline that's in place. And if people don't believe that that is, that is in existence, there is a place to do some homework. Anywhere you go, you will find out about that pipeline that little black and brown boys and girls are being um, tracked to go to prison. Um, but I, I won't go into that in detail now. So restorative practices um, restore justice in that person. Um, when, when I, before I began to, uh, go into the prisons with restorative practices, I went in with, um, a project that teaches meditation in prisons. And never once did I ask anybody what they were in there for. That is so not what we need to be about. All the harm that has been caused in these United States has got to show up in human beings. It is, it's a given, especially if they are poor and if they are of color or if they don't fit into 
uh, some neat um, profile of a good person. But what I found out when I first, this was in the 80s when I would first go into prisons with a project that taught meditation, I would find that because they would offer this, the, the men and women would offer this information, I would find that at least two out of the five or six people I was talking to wow. had been abused as children. More more for the girls or the women than for the boys or men. But this is what was offered. And so why wouldn't, if if we think middle to upper class people right now who have the the wherewithal to to go into various treatments or uh, counseling modalities, we know that being able to talk with a professional professional um, allows a person to feel as if they can begin to heal. None of that was ever done for these people who were sent to prison as children or teenagers and then ended up in adult prisons handled by prisons for the rest of their lives and there was nothing inside the prison to or inside the schools they went to to look at the harm that had been caused to them and Americans, you know, people in the United States love to say things about right. how people make bad choices. But based on what? You made a bad choice to be born poor or as a person of color. You made the choice to be a girl or a woman. No, that is the way you were born. But there are systems in place that further old thinking and prevent people from healing. So these restorative practices in the schools and in the prisons or in any setting where um, it will work and it will work in many settings um, allow for people to um, to heal and thereby um, begin the healing for in some instances for people they have harmed. So um, there's a very simple term um, that I heard from one of my dear friends who I first began to understand restorative practices with. And she says, Uh hurt people hurt people. And Healing people heal people. So um, it's so simple and it's for real. And um, this is why um, I look back on my life and I and I recognize that this is why I developed once I was out of solitary confinement and for the last for the last um, two. Six months of my incarceration, I was released into the mainstream population of women. And I got to meet all of the women who, um, you know, had been putting themselves, putting their lives on the line to talk to me in a clandestine fashion because Mm. they were disallowed from doing that, which is horrific. But once I, once I was out there, I saw that women were there for ridiculous reasons. Um, They were there because they'd been put on the streets as prostitutes by a man who they thought loved them. They were there because they held a box that had drugs in it. They were there because they wrote a bad check. And, And I thought to myself, my goodness, there are mm. people who do this all the time at the top levels of government. They don't go. They don't go to prison. What can we do here? I can't change that now. I don't even know if I'll ever get out of prison, and I truly didn't know what the results of that 
court process would be. But I did know that the most healing thing in the world is love. And so under the guise of um, uh, doing each other's hair, we would, you know, because the <laughs> prison would allow us to do each other's hair. I figured that out. And so we would um, have these conversations that were so deep and so amazing and so healing. And I would say, though I'm not, I wasn't a researcher then, that the women who were most involved in that little project that we called Sister Love um, didn't return to the prison. The ones who couldn't benefit from it did. So it had something to do with recidivism. And love is also always a healing force. And we all have it. Um, even those of us who don't remember that we have love have it. Um, so that is um, a really difficult choice for people to make to use the love that's right there in their own hearts. It is difficult because of all the things we've been talking about. But in that setting where we didn't have any other people but ourselves, we were able to really care for one another. And um, you'll never see that in um, a mainstream movie mm. or TV series about incarcerated women. <laughs> well, let's put it like, like this. We haven't seen it yet. But maybe some great mind and big heart will, will do it. Erica, there's so much that I'd like to talk to you about, but um, in the interest of time, I, I just like to close with just a just a very simple thing. Uh, you know, it's like um, sometimes life is just hard. You know, we may have like wonderful ideas and tragedy, tragedy, tragedy befalls us. All kinds of things happen. Now, I just wonder what you do in in, term, in terms of your own life, in terms of keeping yourself together, keeping your very positive spiritual spiritual perspective together. Can you share a little bit about your own personal spiritual practice? Yeah, it's real simple. I wake up in the morning. I do a few yoga stretches. I sit for meditation. And at the end of every meditation, I um, remind myself that this, this feeling is what I want to carry through the day. This feeling of strength, this feeling of clarity, this feeling of ease. I want to take this into my day. And so, of course, things arise throughout the day. They did today. Um, but I don't fall apart because I know that that's not going to get me where I want to go. I ask, okay, um, hmm, what can I do here? How can I be of use? Or even better, I say, what I can do, mm. how I can be of use here is dot, dot, dot. And I just go through the day like that. And I make sure that I have moments of quiet. I don't, I'm not talking about silence or times where I check out. I'm just saying, you know, I might be stopped at a stoplight in my car and I just check in with myself and I breathe. I might be in the supermarket waiting in a long line. I, um, am aware of where I am. I breathe. And then I, at night before I go to sleep, I don't meditate, but I recall the day and where I have um, been of use or not. And I do a little bit of um, kindness to myself. And then I fall asleep and then I get up in the morning and do the same thing over again. It's practice comes from practice. Well, that's a beautiful conclusion, Erica. And um, I hope that people listen to it got as much about 
out of this conversation as I did. Um, it's an inspiration to speak with you and to hear what you've, um, you know, what you're doing, what you're doing. And, um, you know, I'll put some links in the, in the show notes so people want to get in touch with you and find out what, what, what you're doing. They can. And um, I'd like to just tell anybody that's listening to the podcast, if you'd like to support it and receive some extra information about the show, you can become a supporter of the show through, through a, a site called Patreon. And for as little as a dollar a month, you can receive extra behind-the-scenes content and, in effect, become a sponsor of the show. To find out more, simply go to patreon.com and look for diversity and spirituality. And thanks so much for listening. And as always, um, I look forward to hearing your feedback. And thanks so much again, Erica. Um, it's, been a, it's been such a joy to speak with you today. Thank you, Angelo. It's been an honor to be on your show. What is diversity? What is diversity?